Good morning and welcome to Calendar Bay Church Online. I'm Pastor John Intoff and thank you so much for joining us for our online service today. Well, I hope that you had a wonderful week and uh, we are officially in May. Uh, the April shower seemed to hang on for the first couple days, uh, but hopefully we're moving towards that May flower weather. I know that I uh, had some buds on my tree in my front yard and my lawn is starting to look pretty green. We might have to get the mower out pretty soon. So I am excited about that. I don't know if I'm excited about the mowing, but the fact that the grass is growing, that's good. Well, thank you again for being a part of our worship service here at Calendar Bay Church. Uh, there's a few ways that you can be involved in our service. Number one is what you're doing presently, which is watching the service online. Now, you can do that two different ways. You can uh, watch our YouTube premiere, which takes place every Sunday morning. Um, most of the time, there are a few occasions when it doesn't work out. But on most occasions, there will be the YouTube premiere, which takes place Sunday morning, 1030 a.m. You can watch the service with others. Uh, all you have to do is go to our YouTube channel, which is Calendar Bay Church, or the link that's on our website, calendarbaychurch.ca, and you can watch the service and interact with others as you watch the service. Uh, after that point, it is available at any time, so you can watch the service uh, whenever you want. Uh, you can also join us in person for our worship service. We meet every Sunday morning, 1030 a.m. Uh, we have kids programs for those that are ages 5 to 12. Uh, there's nursery on most weeks for the younger kids. And as we move towards the fall, we're looking forward to maybe adding that third piece for beginner junior church. You know, the not nursery, not junior church kids. And so we're excited about that possibility. Be watching for that as we move into September. But whatever way you enjoy our service, whether it's be online or in person, thank you for being a part of Calendar Bay Church. Uh, if you want to find out what's going on at Calendar Bay Church, the best way to do that is you can uh, go to our website. We have a bulletin section, calendarbaychurch.ca slash bulletin, and you can check out all the different things that are going on this week. Uh, we also have a weekly email that we send out that gives highlights. It also gives a link to that. It's called the Weekly Encouragement, and you can get on that list uh, by contacting us here at the church. Actually, you can get onto it by going to the website as well. Um, but uh, probably the easiest way, just contact us here at the church, either by email, info at calendarbaychurch.ca, or by phone, 705-752-1649. Uh, you can also check out our Facebook group, a lot of information, and some daily encouragement on our Facebook group. Thank you for your ongoing support of Calendar Bay Church. And if you would like to give to the church, the two main ways that you can do it, number one is by setting up an e-transfer. All you need to do is go to calendarbaychurch.ca slash give, and it gives instructions on how you can do that. Uh, you can also mail your gift in to our mailing address, which is Calendar Bay Church, Box 218, Calendar, Ontario, P0H1H0. Again, that mailing address is... Uh, Calendar Bay Church, Box 218, Calendar, Ontario, P0H180. This morning, we're going to take the opportunity to be able to celebrate around the Lord's table. And so if you're watching at home, I would encourage you just to get some juice and some bread. And, and that way you can partake as we uh, uh, do so together. And, but uh, to lead us there, we're going to sing the song, Oh, Praise the Name. Just a great reminder of Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. And let's sing and worship him this morning. Oh, 
rising sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus Each month at Calendar Bay Church, we like to take time to remember and reflect on the death of Christ and on our behalf. And we do that by doing what Scripture commands us to do, which is taking a time to remember and celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, Jesus instituted this even before he died as a way of remembering his death and sacrifice on our behalf. And as we partake this morning, uh, we do want to take some time just to reflect. And, and in the, uh, your home, I want you to be thinking about what you are thankful for. You know, we, God gives us so many blessings. You know, we've sing the song uh, 10,000 Reasons, which is just a, um, a song that reflects on how many things that we have to give thanks. And, and we have so many different blessings. You know, the hymn writer said it so well when he said, count your blessings, name them one by one. And so let's just take some time right now in the privacy of your home. Just be thinking about what you are thankful to God for. Because when we do so, it, it, the word of God says to give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will. And so let's reflect and, and let's just take a moment and pause and wherever you are, if you want to say them out loud or, or just uh, in your heart, let's reflect and give thanks before we partake together. Heavenly Father, we do take time to say thank you to you. When we reflect on your goodness, we know that you are always good. As we reflect on your faithfulness, we know that you are always faithful. When we reflect on the plans that you have for our, us in our lives, we know that you are always working things out for good. We thank you for your always nature, that you are always um, completing the process that you have begun in our lives. And so God, as we th give you thanks this morning, we say most of all, thank you for your gift of your son, that he died for us, so that we could have life, that that life was abundant and it was free, and it was a guarantee of everlasting life where we will be with you for eternity. And while we live this life on earth, we will walk each day in thanksgiving to you, 
because you have been good and you continue to be good and your love endures forever. And we thank you that Jesus brought us these, um, these ways of remembering. And as we hold in our hands the body, the symbol of your body, which was given for us, as we partake together, it's an immense gratitude that is on our hearts. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we eat together, let's give thanks for all that he has done. Let's eat together. Jesus also, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup that represents the new covenant that is in my blood. And every time you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. And we are so grateful that God wants us to bring our cares and our concerns. And as we partake together in the symbol of his, the wholeness that he brings in our lives, we know that God wants to bring healing in our lives. He wants us to bring us to a point of um, that our mental faculties are in his hands and that there are so many things that we can give to him. And so let's just take a moment and pray for our needs within our congregation and in your life. I just want you to be thinking of what is it that you want to uh, have prayer for this morning. And just give that to God and let's pray for those needs together. Jesus, we are so grateful for your shed blood, for the fact that you shed it so that we could have forgiveness of sins, and that through the shedding of your blood, you brought us into uh, perfect peace with you. And God, we are so grateful that through your death, you bring wholeness and completeness to our life. And as we walk this journey of life, we know that there are many different needs, and so many who are listening this morning have a physical need that needs to have a touch from you. And God, we just lift that up to you. God, for many, they're going through difficult circumstances which have, have tried them uh, mentally and has left them discouraged and defeated. And God, we know that your word promises us a sound mind and that you want us to keep our minds stayed on you. And in that process, you bring us peace. And so, God, we are so grateful for the peace of God that transcends understanding, that can guard our heart and our minds. God, we thank you that you love us, but you also love those that we love as well. Those people that have uh, need to know you as their Lord and Savior, and that they need to know a touch from you. God, we just lift those people up to you. God, we are so grateful for this symbol that we hold in our hands, the symbol of your shed blood. And we thank you for what it represents, the forgiveness of our sins, and that through the, your shedding of your blood, you bring us into a right relationship with you. Jesus, we give you thanks. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's drink together. Before we look into God's word, we want to invite the Holy Spirit just to be able to speak to our hearts and our minds. And so let's lift up uh, this song of praise. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And let's sing it and just ask God that he would speak to our hearts this morning. Let's sing together. free 
This morning we're wrapping up a series of messages called kaleo and kaleo is the greek word for calling 
and that God has placed a calling on each one of our lives. Uh, some it's a more specific call to a role, but there is a general call of God upon, placed upon every single one of us. And we've been using the scripture from 1 Peter 2.21. And in 1 Peter 2.21, it says, To this you were called, there's the word kaleo, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And so the question we've asked, and, and actually the book uh, in his steps talked about what would Jesus do? And Jesus lived out his calling as he went about his activities. And so as we look at the life of Jesus, we, we saw a number of key calls upon our life. Uh, the first one we saw was is that Jesus uh, cared and showed compassion to people. And so there is a call to care for people and that that really reflects the heart of God and that we care for one another that we show compassion to people and so we make sure that we keep at the forefront the call of Jesus to care and show compassion and a couple weeks ago we looked at the fact that uh, God calls us to generosity uh, the scripture tells us that freely God is given to us and, and the biggest gift that he gave, God so loved that he gave his only son. God reflects the heart of being a giver. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. God is extremely generous. And so freely he is given. And then the other half of that verse is, is that freely give. That that is what our response to the generosity of God is, is, is that out of our lives flows generosity. And so God wants us to be generous with our finances, and God also wants us to be generous with our resources. And he wants to make sure that when it comes to our finances, that we put him first in those things. First things first, because when we do that, God knows where our hearts are and he can work in our lives and then last week we talked about that god also calls us to service that at the very heart of jesus's ministry was service he talks about that uh, if you want to be great in the kingdom of god that you need to be a servant of others that he himself came as a servant and to give his life as a ransom for others and so this was at the very heart of what God wanted to do was is that our Jesus wanted to live out is a life of service. And as, as Jesus was um, preparing to go to the cross, he gives the example of his, to his disciples of washing his, uh, his disciples' feet. And this was to show that we are to have hearts that are full of service. And the last piece that we want to look at is, is that the other, another call on our lives is the call to disciple. You know, we talked about that as Jesus was going to the cross, one of the last things as he taught at the Last Supper was the whole idea of service. And now another kind of last words that Jesus does. Now this is after Jesus has resurrected. He's been with his disciples a few times and he is just getting ready to ascend into heaven. So the, this is like final, final words before he ascends into heaven. And this is what he says in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so here we have Jesus' call to discipleship. The, you know, the last area that he wants to make sure that this is going to continue. As, as Jesus modeled discipleship, they, you know, what were his followers called? They were called disciples, and he called them to him, and he worked with them for three years, teaching them, discipling them, training them, all those things. And so now Jesus is kind of passing the torch to each one of us and saying, 
this is what you need to do. You need to make disciples. And so let's just take a closer look at this passage of scripture. Um, it says, it starts off with a therefore. And I remember uh, one of my first pastors said, whenever you see a therefore, ask what it's there for. And so, and so therefore is a concluding statement. So it has to tie to something else. And so Jesus is saying, therefore, because of something else, you need to make disciples. And so what is the therefore? And it's, it's just in Matthew 20, 18. And this is what Jesus says. He says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So he says, all authority has been given to me. So therefore, and so here we have, basically, this is John's interpretation. This is the call from the top. Jesus has says, because I have been given all authority from God, this is what I'm going to do with my authority. I'm going to say to you, this is what you need to do. And you've been empowered in order to be able to do this task. This is coming right from the top. And it is coming with absolute and utter authority behind it. Go and make disciples. And that's the next concept that kind of comes out of this passage. It says, therefore, and then it says, go. And the idea of go uh, is, is not too complicated. It's a, uh, the Greek word, pur uh, yo e. I don't think I said that very well. It says, to travel, depart, go, take a journey. And there seems to be two kind of ideas that come out of this idea. And, and one is built right into it, uh, that when he says go, he says go to all nations. He says go everywhere. And so there is this kind of call of going somewhere else to be able to uh, tell others about Jesus. And so there needs to be this go, and there is no boundaries. It's not a limited call. It is that it will go everywhere. But there also seems to be the idea that instead of being a specific command, go, it's the idea that it could be translated as you go. So as you go to all nations, as you go, whatever your, wherever your journey, it's not that they, you have to get to the destination. Wherever it is that you're going, you make sure that you're making discipleship, uh, disciples. So this is important. Because sometimes we think, oh, that, that's just a call for certain individuals to go somewhere and they do that. And it's not for everybody. And this passage of scripture picks up on the idea that, this, uh, that as you go, wherever it is that you are going, you need to make sure that you are making disciples. This is the call to every single follower of Jesus Christ, that as you go, wherever it is that you are going, you are going to make disciples. And so what is a disciple? Well, if you're going to make disciples, I guess you better know that. Well, it's basically those that are followers of Jesus. When Jesus was calling his disciples, that was the key phrase that he would go, come, follow me. And so Jesus was looking for people who would follow him. And so the call is still the same for those of us who are going and making disciples. Is this that we make sure that we are leading them to become followers of Jesus. But there also is another side of it, is that they are not just going to be followers in name only, but that they will become pupils and learners. When, when uh, in, in the Bible, rabbis had disciples, and those disciples were people who would learn and grow under that individual's teaching. And so we are followers of Jesus. And so what we are committing to is to become followers of Jesus who are learning from him and, and becoming pupils of Jesus. If we want to, uh, you know, the scripture passage that says walking in his steps, that's often what would uh, be a part of being a disciple was is that you would follow in the steps of the rabbi that you were following. And God wants us to follow Jesus as our teacher and we become followers of him. And so as we're going, your, your world is your calling. 
each one of us has our own little world that we're a part of. You know, I go to my job, I go to these individuals, I hang out with these folks, I watch sports with these individuals, my kids play. Wherever I go, that's my world, and that's my discipleship zone. The other key area is, is that your family is your calling. Nobody has a more specific call than each one of us to our family. That that is one of the key areas where we want to see people becoming disciples of Jesus. It's often some of the most difficult, but we need to make sure that we are trying to get our kids to be followers of Jesus, to become pupils and learners of Jesus and to be able to teach them those things. So wherever we go, in our little sphere that we are a part of, we are to be followers of Jesus, helping others to become followers of Jesus. Disciples who make disciples. And I just want to talk about two misconceptions about discipling. The first misconception is the idea that I am not ready to disciple anyone. And so oftentimes we, we say, you know what, that discipleship, that's for those that are, you know, better than me. I'm not really into that. You know, I, I'm not very good at this kind of stuff. And just because we're not really good at it doesn't excuse us from this calling on our lives. You know, I think of the gift of giving. You know, some people go, ah, it's really not my thing. We're all called to giving. Some may have a better gift at it, but we're all called to that. And it's the same with discipleship. You know what? There might be some that that's their more specific calling, but it does not excuse us from this calling upon our life. And so I think we need to reframe our thinking a little bit when it comes to that. Because many don't feel like they're good enough, they're smart enough, or they're qualified enough to be a disciple maker. That they just don't feel that they, it, they've got the gifting. They don't have the, the basic parts to work with in order to be able to accomplish this. But there's a couple of principles that I want to pull out here. Number one is, is that oftentimes when it comes to discipleship, the most important thing is our availability. Making ourselves available in order to be able to disciple. So that we make ourselves available in conversation, we make ourselves available in our homes, that we make ourselves available. God will use us if we make ourselves available to him in that task. Um, the second principle is, is that, you know, if we don't feel like we're qualified, that we have enough basic information, I'm going <laughs> to say something that's maybe too straight and to the point. You need to get more knowledge. You know what? You can only come up with excuses for so long of, you know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. What are you doing? in order to be able to make sure that that's not true. Do you have to figure out a way of, do you need to attend a seminar? Do you need to do read your word, God's word? You know, do you need to, you know, do something, anything, in order to be able to make yourself feel a little bit more comfortable in the task? It's not good enough to merely just say, well, you know what, I, I just don't have the skills. Yeah, but God wants us to move into this area. It's a calling on your life. And so you need to make sure that, uh, you know, Paul talks about uh, an approved, work, approved workman is able to handle diligently the word, uh, the word of truth. What are we doing in order to be able to do that? And I think this is another key part of reframing our thinking a little bit on this, is, is that you have to leverage what you've got. Because there are lots of different areas of discipleship that we can be a help to people. You know what, if you've been um, married for a significant amount of time, even though maybe your marriage has not always been good, the fact that you're still together, you can help other people with their marriage. 
God wants you to leverage what you've got. You know what? If you've been in a job for an extended period of time, you can disciple people on how to be godly within your job setting. You know what? If you're involved in, in sports or something like that, and you've reflected Jesus in that, you can be a discipler to others in those key areas. God wants to leverage what you've got in order to be able to use it as discipleship opportunities. And so most of your life experience that you've had can help you in order to be able to disciple others. Because discipleship is all about applying the principles of God in the various stages and aspects of our life. And so we need to make sure that we are leveraging what we've got in order to be able to, and so you might be unwittingly a professional in some areas. And most of us have a lot of key areas where we can be of great assistance to other people. And so one of the misconceptions is, is that, you know what, I'm not good enough. God wants to give you everything that you need in order to be a disciple maker in your situation. The second misconception is, is that I, I don't need someone to discipline or disciple me. You know, sometimes you get a little bit older and you don't think that you need to be investing in your character anymore. But God wants you to continue to be a disciple as you grow up. I remember hearing a number of years ago that everybody needs to have three individuals. An Apostle Paul, somebody who can pour into your life. Uh, a Barnabas, somebody who can encourage you along life's journey. And also a Timothy, someone that you're investing in. But we can't forget the importance of making sure that we are continuing to invest in our lives. Because... I think sometimes as you get older, you start to burn out because you've been giving and, and you eventually, because you've done nothing to replenish your soul, you begin to falter and to fail. And this is why, you know, they say that in, in um, particularly in professional ministry, the last number of years are the most difficult because you've been giving and giving and giving for so long and you haven't invested in your own soul. And so you need to make sure that you're doing that. And so we need to look at kind of these, these key growth areas because uh, we need to continue to grow in certain areas. You know, and, and sometimes you go through stages of life. Uh, you know, as you get older, sometimes you go through... Um, uh, grief periods of grief and loss and this is another area where you can be a disciple but you can also learn from other people who have gone before you and so maybe you need to find some people who've been through that and to have them help you in order to be able to grow in that area that you also uh you know Maybe you're going through some health issues and and they're they're not going to kill you but they're chronic they're not going away and you know somebody who's going through chronic health issues, maybe you need God to bring that individual to help you to, through the next stage of life. Whatever stage you're going through, somebody has gone through it and they can help you. Uh, you know, sometimes we talked a little bit about not having knowledge. If there's an area in your life where you don't have knowledge, um, Maybe maybe it's in your spiritual habits. You know, you've been trying to be a Christian for a number of years and you've just never been able to develop a good prayer life or you've never been able to be able to read God's word or you've never been able to practice a solitude and you've never been able, you know, and all these different spiritual habits uh, that maybe you need to find somebody that's better at that and to have them invest in you. We also, there might be some areas where you have some weaknesses in your life. You know, as I'm getting older, <laughs> I always consider myself to be a fairly optimistic individual. Uh, I find I'm getting cynical and grumpy, you know, <laughs> and, and maybe I should be finding somebody to be able to help with that area of my life where I'm starting to be cynical about things. 
and having somebody invest in me, somebody with a positive attitude. You know, there are so many different areas. And, and some, some of you out there, you're wrestling with, with anger. That that's, oh, you've wrestled with it for so long. And there might be somebody who can help you to grow in that area. Maybe, maybe yours is pride. Maybe it's, uh, you know, struggling with some kind of temptation and difficulty. You know, find somebody in order to be able to invest in you. Because the calling of God on our lives is this, that we will live life's life of discipleship. That we are investing in other people and it, helping them to come to a relationship with Jesus. And then we also uh, need to be in the process of discipleship, of continuing to grow and learn. That that's a part of our existence. God never says, get to a certain point, plateau, and then slowly burn out. He says, no, no, you need to continue to grow more into the likeness of Christ each and every day. Always be a disciple. Always make disciples. When it comes to discipleship, a lot of what discipleship is, is it's about setting an example. And, and as we look at this, um, this is what it says in Philippians 3.17. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as uh, you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And so Paul was moving into a discipleship model of example, leading by example. And so Paul was saying, join together and follow our example. And we as followers of Jesus need to live our lives that we are an example for others. Paul says confidently that, you know what, if you follow what I'm doing, you're not going to go far off the path. Can we confidently say that? Can we confidently say to other people, under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, follow my example. And if you follow my example, you'll be good. <laughs> I, I wish I could say it as confidently as Paul. But that's what discipleship is all about. It's about modeling. They say that most of, of teaching is caught rather than taught. And so this is why it is so important in order to be able to uh, model a life of discipleship. Live it out. And as you live it out, then you will be an example for others. And Paul does this with his protege, Timothy. And this is what he says to Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy 4.12. Uh, he says, Don't let anyone look down at you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. So Paul says to Timothy as a younger guy, he says, don't let anybody look down at you because you're young. Make sure that you are building a life that is worthy of example. And God wants the same thing for us. He doesn't want to, you know, I'm young. I don't know anything. I, I, he says, no, 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 don't use that as an excuse. Make sure that you're living a life that's a, a life of discipleship, which is an example for others. Just as Paul said, I want my life to be an example. Now he's saying to Timothy, you let your life be an example to others. And and. Paul picks up on a few key ideas, and I think these are all very important. I'm calling it the D-zone. You know, if you've played sports, they talk about working in the D-zone, uh, which is, refers to defensive in, when you talk sports. But in my, our context, this is the discipleship zone, the D-zone. 
And so Paul says these are the key areas that when you are setting an example, these are the areas that you need to work on and try to set an example in. The first thing he says is that in your speech, and we talked last week uh, when we talked about service, the power of our words. And Paul picks up on that idea. He says, make sure that when you're living your life that you are an example of speech, that you are reflecting Jesus in your encouragement of people, that you are reflecting Jesus in the things that you teach, you are reflecting him in your praise and worship of him, that though everything that comes out of your mouth, as we use our scripture from last week, that they are the very words of God. And so this is one of the key areas of discipleship because people will see what, or they will hear what comes out of your mouth. And if it reflects Jesus, it will be a part of the discipleship process. And so make sure that in your D zone, that you are being an example in speech. And then Paul goes on that in life, you know what, life is crazy. And there are so many different areas in life where we can uh, and this is where we need to know the truth of God and then we need to let it unfold in our everyday life. How will I reflect Jesus in my life? You know, as I'm driving through the parking lot, I often use this as an example because most of us lose our, lose our salvation when we're behind the wheel. Well, you can't lose your salvation if you're committed. Anyway, but, but with sometimes our reflection of our life is not so good when we're in a parking lot or behind the wheel. How can I be an example in my life, in my job? How can I reflect Jesus? Because that is discipleship. How to reflect Jesus Christ in my job setting. When you go to work, are you reflecting Jesus so that your fellow employees look at you and they say, there's something about this guy because in his life, he is an example. So make sure that in life, every aspect of your life, when you're going out for leisure activities, when you are in the store, when you're at work, when you're at social clubs, whatever it is that you're a part of, social media, that you are reflecting Jesus in your life because that's discipleship. What else is in our D zone and our discipleship zone? Paul says it's how you love how we love our wife, our, or our spouse, our kids. Jesus says, how you love the least of these, the poor, they are all going to reflect Jesus. And so in our uh, love, can we model loving relationships? What it truly a godly marriage looks like? How a godly family looks? How our love for people is reflected in all our behaviors? Paul says that in our faith, does our life reflect faith and trust, an unwavering faith and trust in God? Is that there? Because that's what we need to model, that when people see my life, that they see someone who has faith and trust in a living God who's going to supply for their every need, that's going to live, uh, be able to help them to live a life of godliness, that I, I believe that he will accomplish great and mighty things through the power of Jesus Christ. Am I reflecting faith in my behavior? And am I reflecting purity? That in my relationships, am I reflecting when I'm hanging out with the guys at work or the friends at work, am I reflecting the purity of God in my relationships? In my private time, am I reflecting the purity of Jesus? Paul says to Timothy, don't let anybody look down at you, but set an example in your speech, in your life, in your love, and in your faith, and in your purity. These are key D-zone discipleship areas where we need to be reflecting Jesus. And if we ref do these in these areas, then we are discipling those that are around us. We need to be taking the opportunities to be intentional in our discipleship of others. When it comes to discipleship, 
We need to be a disciple and we need to make disciples. We need to be disciples who make disciples. I'm going to continue to be a disciple for the rest of my life and I am going to disciple others so that they will be a part of the discipleship movement. You know, it's the exponential th multiplication of God. God says, you invest in somebody who's going to invest in somebody who's going to invest in somebody and on and on it goes. And this was the last command that Jesus gave to his church. Go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them, laying a foundation of God in their lives. And the promise of God is this. If you go and you make disciples with the authority of God fully backing you, he says, there is a guarantee of the presence of God as you do that. The call of God. We're called to be disciples. And so, whatever area that you are God is calling you to because nobody who is a follower of Jesus is excused from the call of discipleship let's make sure that as we go through our daily activities as you go about your regular activities how can you be a disciple maker let's pray together Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your call on our lives. That you call us to compassion, you call us to generosity, you call us to service, and you call us into this great, your great work of making disciples. God, help us to be able to be disciples who are continuing to be disciples, but also that we are making disciples so that they can make disciples and on and on and on. God, help us to be a part of your great discipleship work. In Jesus' name, amen. Disciples know that Christ is enough. And this song talks about, I've decided to follow Jesus because I know that he is enough. Let's sing it together. Christ is enough.
Well, thanks again for being a part of our worship service here at Calendar Bay Church. And if you're watching the YouTube premiere, I just encourage you in the last few minutes of the service just to be able to encourage one another, bless one another. Maybe there's something that uh, you, you have a question about the area of discipleship, what that means and what it looks like in our lives. Maybe enjoy a time of conversation about that. But let's make sure that as you go from here, that we would be disciples and that we would be making disciples. God bless you. Hope that you have a wonderful week and we'll see you all next week.